How's it go? How's it going, everybody? Would help if I started on the right uh, actual thing today. How's it going, everybody? Welcome to this week's uh, Lumix Live. Uh, it's uh, going to be a, a pretty demo-ish heavy stream today. Uh, I've got a lot of cool stuff that I want to show you all, go walk through on the cameras. Um, as the title says, this is uh, specialty photo and video with the Lumix cameras. And primarily what we're going to be talking and showing about today are kind of more in-depth, detailed demonstrations of the specialty tools that we have in the Lumix cameras. So we're going to have this broken kind of into like two sections here. We're going to start on the photography side and then we're going to end on the videography side uh, or cinema side, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and just kind of walk through some of these different uh, capabilities, the tools, how they work, show you some demos of how they're actually working here in the studio. I've got my S5 Mark II X hooked up here um, so we can show you that. Uh, but throughout the entire stream also, we're going to be taking questions, so just like we normally do, so tag at Lumix USA, this way I can see it. If you've been here for a while, you know how this works. Um, but if you are new here, these are the weekly broadcasts that we do where we have conversations with you, the creators, the users, photographers, videographers, uh, whatever, you know, realm of image creation you're from. Uh, and give you an opportunity to talk to us directly to the brand, get questions asked, hopefully be able to provide you some answers, uh, and then hopefully teach you something new about the cameras that maybe you didn't know or maybe you haven't played around with yet on the cameras that you own. Um, most of what I'm going to be covering today you'll find in pretty much the mid to higher end levels of our cameras. So even going back to like our G9, when we talk about high resolution shot mode and some of the video functionality, uh, and then into things like variable frame rate with <clears throat> the higher end the video side uh, of the cameras as well. So hopefully we'll cover something that's relevant to a camera to you. If we're not covering something or you have a question about some specialty tools that are found in the cameras, feel free to drop them in the chat. Uh, and we'll try to fit them into the kind of pre-setup things that I've got to kind of cover and go over. Uh, before we jump into that, mind you, in the U.S. about Lumix Pro services, we have Red and Platinum. Red is free. If you have purchased a Lumix camera, make sure to take a look at Lumix Pro services Red. You can follow the link uh, down in the description or use the QR code on the screen right now. Uh, that'll get you to the registration page. If you're someone who likes that next level of uh, service and support on your equipment, take a look at the Platinum tier. Platinum tier offers you two-day repairs with next-day shipping both ways, 20% off out of warranty, annual sensor cleanings, EVF, lens calibrations, all of that fun stuff to keep your equipment in top shape for your seasons. Uh, and then you also get exclusive um, membership hotlines, so if you'd rather speak to someone on the phone, you can always do that uh, if you're in that program. Um, but then, like always, we have this. We have Lumix Live, so feel free to always tune in, uh, uh, subscribe, like, comment, all that kind of fun stuff, and we always try to get in and get you guys answers while we're going through. So, uh, before I jump too far in, uh, there were a couple of questions that came in before the stream started, uh, and then I can already see, uh, I see a couple of questions that came up already now, so let's kind of jump through some of those. Uh, the first question, I don't know if it's visible on the chat anymore but it came in before it says um question is can or will panasonic add multiple exposure modes in the s5 mark ii other brands had it and we've had it in previous models as well um as far as possibility of adding it, of adding it to the system i think it's possible um the question really is going to be you know how much how much time is it going to take to do that um if you do notice the multiple exposure capable cameras are running the previous engines that we use, so the previous processors. The new processors, as we said, because it is a totally ground up design, totally new processor, uh, certain things can take a little bit longer to develop on the new architecture. Um, and some things aren't just as simple as a port over from the previous one into the new one. Uh, so, what I would say there is maybe give us a little bit of time still. We are working and pushing a lot of newer things out on this platform. Um, and as we continue to develop and continue to push firmware updates, new and things, things do get added, especially stuff that y'all are letting us know in the chat, in the comments after the video. 
Uh, last week's video, I had asked uh, people if you have recommendations or questions or things that you want to see in the cameras that you leave them in the comment section after the video. And a huge number of you left us comments that help our engineering team see what it is all of you are asking for. So definitely ask those questions. It does not mean that they're going to be overnight changes. Doesn't even mean that they may be possible at all. But when you let us know these things, um, it helps us, you know, kind of figure out where the next steps are for uh, evolution of the products. Something like multiple exposure. The more people let us know, the more you let us know in the comments after the video, uh, the easier it is for me to articulate to our engineering team what it is that you as the users are asking for to see in these cameras. Uh, another one came in from Eric and it says, has the Panasonic 100 to 400 been discontinued or is the rumor online unsubstantiated? Uh, typically as a brand, uh, and you'll probably notice this from most brands, we usually never comment on rumors. Uh, however, I can tell you uh, unequivocally right now that as far as I am aware of, the 100 to 400 is not discontinued. Um, so it's possible that a dealer's website, when it goes, goes out of inventory, it's discontinued, um, and dealer could be anything, um, just could be the flag there. But to my knowledge there, it's not discontinued at this point. Um, they are still available, uh, at least here in the U S you've got them. So yeah, um, hopefully that helps. Uh, let's see here. Um, I'd love to see a 24 to 70 with OIS. Wonder why one, uh, why it wasn't built with it already. Um, this is actually a good question, Zizo. I think I'm pronouncing that right. Um, so when you look at what our initial launch of the S series lenses was designed as, um, and even in the micro four thirds world, typically when you look at lenses that encompass the 50 millimeter and wider field of view, you typically don't see in lens stabilization for the most part there are some exceptions like our 12 to 35 has in lens stabilization that pairs with the body for our dual is um but when you look at especially in the s series the way those lenses are designed what they're designed for and the advances that have happened with in body stabilization it starts to make in lens stabilization an unnecessary redundant uh, kind of system added into the lens. That's not saying that every situation is not benefited from having in lens stabilization. <coughs> but what it means is that it is, it's typically an ultra wide, not as usable, or it doesn't really make as big of an impact on the image, uh, or the stability of that image because of how good the sensor stabilization has gotten because it's active. Um, other challenges come in when you start using floating elements within a lens that can actually alter the way the light comes into the sensor. Um, if you look at like a cross section of a lens, so say we take, uh, I'll use this one because this one looks cooler. Um, if we take like a cross section of the lens, one of these elements would have to be movable, which means that your light is now going to be bending, which yeah, as we would want in a wide angle lens, you would want the light to bend and adjust correctly but that's going to add cost it's going to add size it's going to add weight um, and it adds one more piece in an ultra wide angle lens that can cause things like un you know undesirable vignetting undesirable chromatic aberration stuff like that so a lot of companies have to make the choice do you go for ultra wide angle for a in some cases, negligible increase in what its stabilization effect can be in ultra wide angle for a detriment to image quality, or do you go for having the stabilization in an ultra wide lens, but lower on the image quality and maybe not be able to do things like having electronically parfocal, having minimized focus breathing, stuff like that. So at the time when that lens came out, the, our goal was pure image quality. And when you look at what those lenses can do, they are some of the highest resolving lenses. They're also some of the nicer designed lenses out there. Um, but they are still larger, heavier than some of the counterparts out there. So it, does it mean that we're never going to have a 24 to 70 with OIS? I, I honestly don't know, but currently... I can confidently tell you between 24 to 70 uh, millimeter, um, really all the way out to about 120 millimeter, 
our in-body stabilization is designed to provide you the maximum amount of stabilization that you can get where you're not having to rely on a lens's stabilization to supplement it. When you look at something like our 70 to 200, because it goes out past that 120 millimeter, that's where you do have OIS in that lens as well. Uh, when you look at um, really even the prime lenses, the 24, 35, 50, 85, and 18, they don't have stabilization into them because they're designed to be a little bit smaller, a little more compact. Uh, a lot of those things kind of just go into those conversations. The nice thing, and honestly, even when you look at uh, comparative companies' lenses as well, uh, a lot of the 24 to 70s, it's only recently that you started seeing uh, optic stabilization in some of those focal lengths. And most of the time, it's because the company that's making it has subpar body stabilization. So they have to supplement it some other way. We can think of our system as kind of the opposite. We've done such a good job with stabilization that you may think you need it, but it's actually not going to give you anything extra at this time. So hopefully that kind of clarifies why it didn't have it to begin with, why we may do it in the future, but there's no guarantee one way or another. Uh, and it says, uh, hi, when I transfer photos to my iPhone... Uh, through Bluetooth, uh, some of the pictures transferred are getting a color shift. Um, okay, so uh, first off, you're not using Bluetooth to transfer images. Bluetooth does not transfer images uh, on our system. It is the Wi-Fi system. Um, most likely, what you are seeing in the color shift is couplefold. It could either be that the, um, the color profile that you're seeing on the camera, if you're shooting RAW and JPEG, if you're only sending RAW files over, those raw files, when you bring them in the computer, don't have necessarily the uh, JPEG color profile baked into it. Um, they are neutral, so it could depend on the program that you're using to view the images. Um, the other thing that can happen there too is, even if it's a JPEG, your color balance is between what your camera looks at, so how your display is set, what you're used to seeing there, versus what the color profile is set up on your phone. Uh, most mobile devices out there, out of the box, are set up to be very vibrant and very contrasty. So your images may look very different on your phone than what you see as them on your camera, unless you were to tone down how vibrant your display is. A good example of this is my Z Fold 4. Um, if I leave this phone as the default uh, kind of color profile that Samsung sets for that phone, which makes, you know, reds look super vibrant, it gives it a very different, you know, kind of warmer cast to it. Uh, if I leave it natural the way it comes out of the box, th there's a massive difference between what it looks like on my camera versus what it looks like on my phone. If I turn all of that off and I try to keep it as like neutral as I can, it's much closer but there still will be a little bit of a difference because of the way our mobile device screens are are tuned. Um, and then I, I touched on this before. It can also be like if you've got a warmer color balance uh, set up on the phone. Uh, does your phone have any of the tools set up that shift the hue and the brightness and the, the uh, color mixing of them? These are all things that, one, they are a very big problem uh, when you start looking at wanting to stay as color accurate as you can because if you don't really know exactly how your phone is set up so that's why mobile devices they're okay for editing but color accurate editing do it on a computer uh do it on a calibrated monitor so hopefully that kind of helps answer your your question a little bit there um i wouldn't necessarily think anything's wrong because uh if you take those images and you put them on your computer i'm willing to bet that they look different than what they do on your phone so uh, let's see here. Raven says, should I store a camera with batteries inside or without? The internal battery of my GH4 is dead. I have to reset the time uh, each time after each battery is swapped and want to prevent this on my GH6. Uh, typically, I recommend um, leaving, batter leaving a battery in the camera um, because, yes, your cameras all do have an internal battery in them. That is designed to keep your settings, your, uh, if you're someone like me and you really utilize things like real-time LUT uh, and you have LUTs loaded, if you leave the camera dead long enough, the internal battery goes low enough charge that the internal memory clears for stuff like that, which could be 
um, you know, you're needing to reset your clock, stuff like that. And you have to remember batteries, if they die and they're left dead, are very hard to wake back up or charge back up, if at all. Um, so I typically recommend leave a battery in the camera. If you're going to have the camera stored for an extended period of time, so say like a couple of months, yeah, you can probably take the battery out. Um, you will have to reset the camera, so you will have to go back through that process. But um, modern batteries, charge them up before you put them in the camera, uh, and you should be okay. That's one of the things that we've actually paid a lot of attention to based on user feedback is power off battery drain. So things to keep that internal battery charged. If you're someone that leaves Bluetooth on, uh, there's an option on our cameras called Bluetooth wake up, which means you can use your mobile device to wake up your camera, which consistently draws power from the battery even when the camera's off. Uh, so those are kinds of just things that you may want to keep a little bit in the back of your mind, Raven. Um, but I would recommend leaving a battery in the camera um, if you're going to store it for a medium amount of time. If you're going to be storing it for a long period of time, then yeah, you probably want to take the battery out and deal with, um, you know, resetting the camera settings. But I would recommend doing maintenance to the cameras if they're in storage. Put a battery in for a little while, take it out, make sure that the camera stays, the internal battery stays a little stored. Um, cool. Um, uh, let's see here regarding specialty photo questions. I uh, think you could go over, uh, when you would use which of the three shutter modes and then why not also why, uh, I think, I, I think you're referencing like mechanical, um, uh, I was a mechanical electronic EFC stuff like that. Yeah. I'll definitely talk about that. Um, and then let's see here. Uh, one feature I wish our camera brand would have is more control over our frames. Uh, would love the ability to do a date, shot name, X out of camera. Yeah, that would be nice. Um, cameras typically are locked into certain specifications for the way naming, uh, is done on the cameras. There is the DCIM, which is if you've looked at a camera, you know, you have DCIM is the folder that your photos and videos are typically stored in. Or you have the cinema naming structure, like on the GH6, which does change and allow you to do shot name and stuff like that. Um, you basically have those two options. So you have to kind of work within what the specifications are for those file structures because the camera brands don't write them. They're typically a known standard so that you can go however your computer is going to be designed to do it. So, okay. So with that, let's actually kind of jump in and talk about this stuff. So I've got... Um, I've got one major demo to show here on the uh, photo side. So we're going to look at that first. Um, and actually, FC points this out uh, in the chat and says, Live View Composite will be great for some July 4th firework photos. Uh, and yeah, here in the United States, we are celebrating July 4th. So that typically means uh, tons of fireworks, uh, tons of cool uh, opportunities to do long exposure photography. And if you've ever done long exposure photography before, you know that it... It, it's a mixed bag unless you kind of understand what you're trying to shoot you end up running in with a lot of trial and error if it's your first time ever going out to create or capture any kind of fireworks and fireworks are very similar to like what we call light painting uh, if you've ever done that before where you let the exposure run long and then you put light in front of the image uh, and then you basically paint an image with that light and we have the live view composite functionality in the S series cameras and some of our G series cameras. So I'm going to use my S5 Mark II X here to show you uh, what that actually looks like. So to start with live view composite on the S5 Mark II X uh, and other cameras that are compatible with this uh, needs to be in the manual photo mode. So if you look on the bottom left of my screen there, you'll see that we have the M, which is indicating that we are in the manual photography mode, not the M with the camcorder. So this is just manual photo. Uh, you'll see that right now, it looks as though it's just ready to take a standard image. So if I half press the, sh or if I press the shutter, take a picture, it just took a one second exposure. And if we preview that image, it's dull, it's dark. Um, it's focused, but it's dull and dark and you lose all this detail in the shadow region. So what light painting allows me to do and what our live view composite functionality allows me to do is say, I want to take my front custom function button here 
and I am programming it to LC, which is Live View Composite. And I did this by pressing and holding this button, which brings me right into that button's assignment option for our custom settings. So now that it's set to Live View Composite, I can go in, click that button, and then just click Start. Now, the first shot you take is gonna do a dark frame. So this is for noise reduction later so that the camera knows like, hey, this is where hot or stuck pixels may be. These are what we wanna mask out. So I'm gonna take that first shot. It's creating that image. Now it's ready to actually start. So all I have to do now is press the shutter and you'll see the counter going up on the side, but you'll notice that the image really isn't getting that much brighter, right? It's still dark. There's still some, you know, you see my lighting in the back here is showing blue uh, on the edge of the TV, but I can take an LED. So I have an Aperture MC light here and I have this one in red. And what I can do now is I can bring this into the frame here and I can slowly paint in some different accent lighting. So you'll see that, oh, hey, there was a camera hidden kind of in the background there. And I can just move this over here, paint it. You can start to see that S5 Mark II logo showing up more. Um, and and it's, it's just adding a little bit of extra kind of look to it. So, okay, cool. That's one color. But it still looks really dark. So I can take my second light, which I've got set up in blue, and I can bring this to the other side and add some contrasting light here. So now we'll add, we'll see we're bringing those shadows out. And all I'm doing is I'm just moving this light in just different areas to kind of paint in where I want to see more of that, you know, kind of color show up into the image. But now what's super cool with this, and you'll see like, okay, hey, cool, yeah, so you're adding light, what is that actually doing for things like fireworks? Well, fireworks are light trails. When you take the picture, you're going to see the trail go up through the image. So if you want to see something cool, and I'm going to have to go away from the microphone for this, watch the image as I take this light and I move it actually to where it's within the frame. So you see I get this kind of sweep through it because that's the trail that the light was in. But now I also want to do this with the red light as well. So I've got my red light and I want to come in maybe from a slightly different angle and go maybe a little bit deeper into this. So let's add that to the image too. So now that both of these lights have gone in, you'll see that it's brought some nice extra contrast into this image. It's lit up the shadows. It's kind of showed a little bit more. I'm going to add just a little bit more light into that shadowed region there because I can see it's a little dark on the screen. And now all I have to do with this image is just press the shutter again. And that image is now stored. Now the cool thing with Live View Composite is that when I go back into playback and I look at this image, I have this full-blown raw image that I now can work with in post. So when I come in here, you'll see that one, I didn't bump the table, which is nice. It's sharp, it's added that extra color and that pop into the image. And you can do this with obviously any color, any lights that you want to do it with. And I have those start, the light trails in there. And as I said, this references kind of what you would see in firework type photography. Um, I even had one that I did before where I was a little bit more aggressive with the lighting. And what this does is it set, this shows you that the way Live View Composite works is just additive. So if this was a totally black frame and I want to capture the burst, so I want to see the fireworks streak go up, uh, the flame at the bottom, I want to see when it gets up in the air, and then when it bursts and actually starts to spread out, I want to see those light trails. Well... I no longer have to figure out and say, well, is this going to be like a 30 second exposure? And if it's a 30 second exposure, is the foreground going to be blown out? How is all of the additional lighting going to kind of, you know, impact what it is I'm trying to see? Live View Composite lets you watch that, that burst show up on the frame. So if you want to overlay multiple different, multiple different, say, firework explosions or light painting to, uh, additions to an image, you are seeing them build on the screen and then stopping the recording when you're ready for that image to be done. And again, this gives me that tool of, I like the way that looked. 
I wasn't necessarily, you know, I'm not super thrilled with this one. I like this one a little bit better because it's a little bit more, you know, kind of vibrant. But I have that image and it is a raw image. So that means that I have full flexibility with this file when I bring it into software to actually start working with. So hopefully that gives you a good idea and kind of a rough understanding of how Live View Composite works. You saw how easy that is. It's literally just hit the shutter button, paint with light, hit the shutter button again. Um, and your same setup will be for uh, the, the fireworks. You just want to make sure that you're setting your shutter speed to something that's long enough that you're going to get the desired effect that you want. Um, but also set your exposure so that the brightest part of the image, so if you don't want, say, a cityscape, say, uh, which is what I typically do, I photograph Austin skyline during the fireworks, I want the city skyline to be actually pro you know, as properly exposed as I can, and then I want the fireworks over top, and I want it in one image. So I can do this, set my exposure so that the br only the new bright stuff is added to the image. So... Let's see here. I uh, see a couple more of those questions that came through here. Um, let's see here. Where did we go? Regarding specialty, we did that one. Um, Sacred City. To me, ProRes Raw looks better than internal, uh, but it should only be editing that is improved. Is it just placebo effect? When I take the Pepsi challenge, I can swear I see the difference. Uh, well, yeah, ProRes Raw and Blackmagic Raw are going to give you a very different looking image than what the, uh, internal compression can do because Raw doesn't have noise reduction applied to it. Well, for the most part. Um, so yeah, you would, it, it would be, I, I mean, yeah, there, the, there is a difference whether it's better or not. It's really just comes down to the fact that ProRes Raw requires to be edited um, or transcoded to something that you can use uh, in standard programs. In the typical um, uh, typical internal uh, image processing, there's some noise reduction, there's sharpening, there's stuff like that that happens to an H.265 and H.264 piece of footage. So they will look different. Um, you're not really not, you, you know, you're not really thinking you're seeing a difference, you are seeing a difference between them. Yeah. Uh, Sean says, are any more updates coming for the GH6? Uh, even if I did know, I wouldn't be able to tell you about future plans or updates. Unfortunately, Sean, sorry. Um, uh, bu -bu 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 -bum. Will there be a multiple exposure? Um, so I, I'm going to, I'm going to call you D. Uh, uh, I did talk about that at the beginning. I, the uh, multiple exposure is one of those things that uh, currently, because of the new engine, we don't offer it on the newer cameras, but it doesn't mean that we won't offer it in the future. Um, let's see here. Uh, any chance we'll see EL Zone implementation on the ES5 Mark IIx? It was added in Vericam firmware update, so maybe there's a way we can get it too. Hopes. Uh, honestly, not sure. Um, one of the things you do have to remember, it's kind of tied into like what I said with the uh, multiple exposure stuff, is that um, not everything that was done on the previous engines has been ported in to work on the new engines. Um, doesn't mean that it's a no, but it also doesn't mean that it's a yes at this point. So uh, not sure about EL Zone if it would be there yet. Uh, Kristen says, uh, should I disable image stabilization when using a tripod? Uh, you don't really have to, um, state the in-body stabilization in the dual IS system that we use. If the camera is stable long enough and not moving, uh, it goes into kind of like a standby kind of mode. So you don't really need to turn it off. Um, you can turn it off if it, if it makes you feel better. Um, I typically do leave it on. Uh, mainly because there are some situations where I'll have the camera sitting on a tripod and the ground that the tripod on may not be perfectly stable. Uh, like if I'm on a bridge or something like that. And I've actually found that I get sharper shots with stabilization on even when I'm on a tripod um, because it can counteract tinier little kind of shakes or bumps that you may see. Um, so, yeah. 
Uh, with the composite viewer, will you expose for the background first? Uh, you have my interest peaked with this in, for the July 4th. So, um, the way live view composite is going to work is typically you actually want to expose for the brightest part of the image that you want to protect. So if I'm doing, uh, and this is actually a good, uh, segue here. And this is why I wanted to do live view composite first. Cause it actually, there's a lot involved with it. So if we look at this image here, this was shot using Live View Composite. And what you'll see is that I I did blow the lights out on these buildings. Um, and this is actually a good point of like what I was saying where I was on a boardwalk. So there is subtle shake in this image still. Um, you can kind of see it uh, depending on like what stars you kind of look at. But you'll see it in the buildings because buildings also move. Uh, but with this exposure, I had to basically make the choice. Do I want to have... Like, do I care that this part of the image is perfectly protected? Or do I want to make sure that I'm a little bit more in the middle for this region so that I can keep the stars and not have a totally blacked out sky? Uh, in my case, I chose a little bit more of a mid-ground here so that when I come in and I do my edit to the image, uh, it, it gives me a little bit more control over it. So... While, yes, my shadow region was pretty crushed down, uh, it still allows me to be able to, you know, kind of pull my highlights back, get a good-looking image, pull enough of those stars out of the um, the actual sky here. And this is what I meant by you see that you get, you know, footprint or footsteps, things like that that can happen sometimes. Um, this is where having stabilizer on could help um, or just picking a more stable uh, platform on the ground to work with. Uh, so it's really going to be up to you um, as far as how you'd want to set your exposure uh, for light uh, for fireworks stuff like that. I would recommend unless you're doing something complex where you've got a city skyline that you want to protect as well, um, you set it for something relatively bright. Um, when I do it, I'm typically having my shutter speed at about. Um, one second to maybe five seconds, five or six seconds. And then I'm stopping down a bit. Um, I'm using a moderate ISO. So I'm probably actually going to be shooting at about 640 ISO to get to that uh, rating. And then using live view composite to let the image go. Uh, and then just build out for the look I want. So hopefully that helps. Uh, can we expect any firmware updates from the BS1H? I would love an internal waveform monitor. Uh, an internal waveform monitor and more all eye options. Uh, since the BS1H relies on an external monitor, I don't believe waveform would come to that camera um, because one, we don't send waveform out over HDMI anyway uh, or over SDI. Uh, and as far as all more all eye options, if you could tell me what all eye options you're missing, that's probably a better way for me to kind of help and see is this something that our engineers would be able to look at. Um, let's see here. Any chance of a GX10 micro four thirds or full frame rangefinder style body? I, I honestly don't know. Um, rangefinder flat type style bodies are a, I'd say a hit or miss thing in the photography videography world. Uh, in some cases you have factions of people that love those cameras. In other cases, you have a larger faction of people that just don't care for them. Um, the more you let us know in the comments, uh, the higher the probability of something like that is to be developed. Um, but importantly, you got to tell us what do you, what would you want to see in a rangefinder styled camera? That's really kind of the important thing. So if you have requests, stuff like that, that you want to see, let us know, drop it in the comments after the video. Cause that helps us feed that back. So, uh, let's see here. On the S5 Mark II, when using an external monitor, the inbuilt screen shows a clean video feed only. Any chance it could be an option to show the same in the external, same as in the external monitor? Uh, so I imagine what you mean is if I'm looking at, say, my camera feed here, uh, if I'm looking at this, you want to have all of the user information also on the rear screen. Um, currently at the moment, our system does not uh, allow that it does not have the the setup to support having the information display out simultaneously uh, to an external monitor and on the internal monitor 
Uh, I don't know if that is something that can or will change, um, but we can always ask. Uh, any on-camera flash recommendations for the S5 Mark II X uh, for events? Uh, yeah, sure. I use uh, these. I use the Godox uh, V... Which one is this? This is the V862. Uh, these are the flashes I use. Um, can use our flashes if you want. Um, but yeah, I use these all the time. They work great. Uh, do you think it's a good idea to wait for the new macro from Panasonic for the S series or gonna buy the 105 if I grab a good deal? Uh, I mean, we've we've shown that we are planning a macro lens for the system. I believe that's what the, the roadmap is showing. Um, I own the 105 mil uh, from Sigma. I love the lens. I... Uh, Look, I, obviously I'm going to say our lens is the one you should buy, uh, but the L-mount is designed so that you're getting the best from what's available. So if there's something that we don't make now and you need it for work, go for it. Uh, if you're looking and you say like, hey, I want to get something that's, you know, on brands, so I want to stay within Lumix, then yeah, you wait for the Lumix one. I have no idea when that's going to be, so you could be waiting a really long time, you could be waiting a short time, I don't know. Um, if you got a really good deal on the 105, that's why I bought mine, so yeah. Uh, with a slower shutter speed, the viewfinder I notice is laggy on my S5 Mark II. Is there a setting I'm missing to prevent this? Yes. So. Some of the other tools, um, and this is a, a good photography segue into uh, a couple of the other tools here. Um, our cameras have a couple different ways for showing you what the exposure is doing in the camera. Uh, out of the box, you'll see that constant preview is typically turned off. Constant preview is designed to basically give you and say, hey, uh, this is what either your aperture value is doing to the image or this is what your aperture and shutter speed is doing to the image. Um, you can get into this by saying go to constant preview, go to set, effect, and then you can pick how you want it kind of molded out. Typically for me, because I don't care what the shutter speed looks like, I don't care if it's dragging or whatever, I'm usually doing that with intent. Uh, I leave this as aperture for, uh, to dis if show the aperture effect in aperture mode and in manual. Uh, and then I usually have preview with manual focus assist turned on, uh, and then I can turn this on. Uh, if you are not using constant preview, if you have constant preview turned off and you are noticing that there are some times where the, um, the viewfinder looks like it's a little bit laggy, uh, this can be two things. One, it could be either that you're shooting in a low enough light environment that the camera is... Basically, it, it has to start to slow down the refresh rate so that it can boost the image enough to show you what it looks like. Um, the way you're describing it here, it looks as though that it's probably constant preview is doing this to you. Um, so constant preview off, even when you get down to a low enough uh, lighting scenario, is going to cause a little bit of a lag. Uh, but we built in Live View Boost into these cameras. So Live View Boost has two options here. You have Mode 1 and Mode 2. Uh, mode 1 means that it's going to brighten the display uh, for the LCD and the viewfinder. However, you will see a bit of a frame rate drop in the viewfinders themselves to keep from getting to where it's basically a shutter speed effect uh, to show you. Uh, mode 2 uh, drops it substantially. So if you are shooting in like pitch black, you can go mode 2 because you'll be able to see to compose your image but it will be laggy because it's gonna boost the gain really, really high on the preview uh, that you see in the screen. This does not affect your image. This is just as a way to help you kind of customize for your typical shooting scenario what, what the display shows you, whether you wanna see what the preview looks like uh, for framing or if you're just more uh, focused on being able to see something there. Uh, and then you have the ability to set this, whether this shows in the PASM options or whether it only shows in manual photo. So that's a photo level option. In video, if you start dropping your shutter speed, you will see the effects of what a slower speed uh, shutter speed looks like on a piece of video footage. Um, 
so yeah, you'll have a little bit of a, a some differences there, uh, just how that works. So the first thing I would check uh, is take a look and see if you have Live View Composite uh, turned on there. Uh, Chief says, is full frame 4K 48 or 60p in any way like pixel binning or line skipping possible in a future firmware update? Um, it's a good question. Um, because we don't detail the sensor specifications out, uh, there's no way for any of us to say one way or another whether it can or can't. I don't care what other people say online, what they think they know. Um, you're hearing directly from us. Is 4K48... Uh, 4K60 is not going to be full frame. The sensor cannot do it. I don't care what other people are saying. It just doesn't do it. Uh, 4K48, I believe that's not possible uh, on the camera in full frame. Uh, pixel binning and line skipping causes major drops in image quality, and whether or not the hardware is capable to do those things is a totally different part of the conversation. Um, so at this point, there really isn't anything I can say one way or another definitively that yes or no, but it's going to lean much closer towards the no, uh, in that particular setup. Uh, from day one, we've tried to be very transparent that 4k 60 has to come from super 35, 4k 48 is from a super 35 region as well. Um, so especially when you're shooting in 4k, um, so yeah, uh, let's see here. On the BS1H, all intra stops at 4K30. I believe anything uh, anything higher res or FPS we're stuck with long gop would love to see a 5.9 or 6K all eye or a 4K 60P all eye. Okay, now I understand. Um, you probably won't see those, uh, mainly because of a couple of things. One, all intra uh, runs, it's a lot harder to create the all intra uh, with the camera, surprisingly. Uh, so... It's not necessarily that the sensor can't do it. It's more that when you start looking at the old, the total heat package that's generated in these cameras, when you start pushing higher and higher and less compressed, um, you can generate a lot more heat. Uh, so yeah, when you go above 4K30, you are in a 4.2.0.10 bit. Um, they are HEVC files, so they're actually designed to be uh, better compression, higher quality. That's just kind of how that works. Um, so at this point, I mean, we can ask, but... I, I believe the last conversations I've had about that is that it's it's not um, anything over that you're not going to see um, in 422.10 bit at this point. Uh, one more question regarding S5 Mark II with external monitor. I have disabled audio to the external monitor. The sound on camera is still muted. No beep happens when starting recording. Is this a bug? Um, you've disabled audio to the external monitor. The sound on the camera is still muted. Uh, no beep habits. Double check and make sure that you... So when you turn HDMI or the audio out, uh, make sure... Okay, so one, there are the multiple different uh, options here. So AF beep, uh, the button beeping, and then the shutter volume. And then also you'll see... If I didn't hit the shutter button and go out of that. Um, this is where under HD... Nope, not HDMI connection. I have to go to... Input output, HDMI rec output, sound output over HDMI. Um, I don't believe that uh, it's a bug, um, but I'd have to double check and see if it's that when you want HDMI out, you still want the beep to happen on the camera. I believe those two are separated, um, but I can double check uh, with the engineering team. So, okay. So, uh, we're okay. Yeah. All right, cool. We got through those questions. We still got plenty of time here. Um, so cool. Yeah. So, uh, obviously with live view composite, we said that's probably one of the bigger, uh, you know, kind of things that you have as far as specialty tools go on the camera. We are still the only full frame camera in the market that's offering this kind of computational style of photography in the camera. Uh, and then we also have the high resolution shot mode on our cameras as well. So if you are someone that wants to be able to capture, you know, high resolution images and you only want to really carry around one camera, the Mark II and the Mark II X and the G9, uh, the GH6, they are going to be the cameras that offer you that kind of bigger flexibility. So on 
the S5 Mark II and the Mark II X, you can get up to a 96 megapixel image. So by default out of the cameras, you're getting 24.2, pretty good, solid resolution, you know, nothing really too major there. But what it allows me to do is take the sensor shift capabilities on the camera, and I'll move these back a little bit here, uh, lets me take the sensor shift capabilities on this camera and be able to capture in a couple different ways. So by default, our high resolution mode on the uh, Mark II and the Mark IIX and even the S5, they take eight images, stitch them together to create your four times the resolution image. So it gives me a 96 megapixel image. Um, this can be done in a number of different modes. So if I go back and we take a look at this image here, you'll see I've got it. It is in high resolution, which lets me, uh, you see that icon indicated uh, on the right hand side. Uh, so under the sRGB, that icon is telling you that this was shot as high resolution. Uh, and what it gets me is yeah, four times the resolution. I get uh, 96 megapixels in this particular image. But we have more tools here with this as well. So if I go into the main settings, you'll see that you have high resolution mode settings. So we come in here, picture quality, uh, we've talked about this before, picture quality is what is determining whether or not, what, whether or not you want RAW and JPEG or RAW or JPEG or just JPEG or just RAW, however you want that. When it says combined, it's using whatever your standard camera settings are, or you can manually come in here and say, I only want one of the others. Uh, but what is really cool about this is that you also get a simultaneously recorded standard shot. So what this means is that when I take that image, I'm getting the high res and I'm getting a standard 24 megapixel image. So if you don't like how the high res came out, you've still got that image stored of you know, whatever it is you're photographing at 24 megapixel. And then we have probably the thing that we're at this point, I'd say probably most known for with our high resolution mode is our motion blur processing. So you've got two options here. Mode one allows you to say, Hey, I want motion blur to stay in the image. So if I am, you know, shooting say a waterfall or moving water, like on a lake, and I want that lake to actually kind of blur, I can leave this in mode one, and it means that the water is gonna be actually moving as if it were moving. Uh, you're gonna get multiple images, they'll be layered on each other, uh, but it, it gives you that look. Mode two, on the other hand, is designed to actually suppress that motion in the image. So this is where it will actually be intelligent and look and say, hey, this is an, this area moved a lot. I need to use one of the images to just kind of create the single look of that. I don't want to have motion. This is where it can intelligently look and say, hey, if you're doing landscape and you've got, you know, a light breeze going through and some, you know, trees are moving a bit, it's going to be able to freeze that motion still and intelligently pick out and scale image properly to get you a high resolution image that's using all of those those possible images to reconstruct and create something that is both higher resolution, but also not showing an artifact of multiple images having been stitched together. Uh, if you look at what a lot of people uh, have, you know, kind of reviewed of how our high resolution shot mode is, our motion uh, processing is probably the best currently available in a camera series. Um, so if you have a camera that has it, I encourage you to play around with it. Even when you go back to like our G9, our G9 has high resolution shot as well. If I remember right, it was actually the first camera that brought high resolution shot as well. So you've got a lot of, you know, kind of cool stuff here. Um, HSS videography, my S5 II is uh, only 81 megapixels in high resolution shot mode. Uh, 81 megapixel would mean that you have the camera set in an aspect ratio. So like, say if I set my camera to 16 by nine, you'll see that high resolution shot is locked at 81 megapixel. That's because you're losing resolution from top and bottom. High, 96 megapixel is gonna be in three by two. So if you go back up here and you change it to three by two, you see it goes to 96. Uh, the cool thing with our cameras though, um, and this, I guess this can be considered a specialty thing, is that when you are doing, um, 
uh, when you're using the aspect ratios on the camera, you're still recording the full height and width of the sensor for stills in RAW. So if you're doing this uh, in high resolution shot mode, you're still gonna have that 96 megapixel. When you bring it into your software, it's just gonna be pre-cropped in to 16 by nine or one, um, 16 by nine or one to one or four by three. So yeah, uh, let's see here. Let's see a couple other video questions that came in here. Uh, Chris says, hybrid shooting a fluffy snow tonight, uh, nervous on cams. Uh, thinking of GH6 with only a f with Olympus 40 to 150 2.8 and my S1, what lens for the S1? 85, 24, 50, thanks for the advice. Excited and nervous. Uh, between those three lenses for the Lumix camera, I mean, they're all going to be fine. Uh, it just depends on your field of view. Um, if it's at, if it's at night, uh, I personally prefer faster lenses at night. Um, however, if you're, if you know that you're going to be trying to shoot at deeper depth of fields, the 2470 can be perfectly fine for you. Um, really for something like that. Uh, it's all just going to come down to your, your shooting and your kind of exposure, which I'm going to use as a segue actually to talk about, uh, one of the other tools here. And that was actually, uh, to go over the idea of using things other than the meter on your camera to actually judge your exposure. Uh, we had it brought up before, uh, which was about the, uh, waveform, uh, on the B, uh, BS1H question. Uh, but we do have waveform in the camera, which will help, um, uh, and Chris, I know you've, you've shot for a little while. So, um, some of this may be a little redundant, but for a lot of people, uh, waveform is that tool that allows you to set your exposure properly, uh, based on elements within your image. So you have that as a tool, uh, to work with, but in the Lumix cameras, we also have another tool built in. Uh, which kind of helps you uh, work in situations where maybe you're actually going to be more deliberate with how you're lighting your image. Um, a lot is made about how run and gun videography, you know, you don't have control over lighting. You got to be as, you know, kind of nimble as you can. And that's well and great. But there is also an entire group of people that actually spend time or have the time available to them for setting up their lighting, setting up your lighting ratios, how you want this image to look, how overexposed uh, past your mid-tones do you want this particular part of the image? How, how dark do you want this other part of the image uh, to be? And that's where we've built in the luminance spot meter functionality. So luminance spot meter is a tool that we've built into the cameras, and I'm gonna put this into vlog so it looks a little bit uh, better, it's a little bit easier to understand. And I'm going to grab my uh, video color checker here. And we are going to put that in the frame here. And what Luminance Spot Meter allows me to do is take the, the tool itself here, which is this box, move it around onto a gray card in this case, and say, hey, I want my exposure to be set up so that my, mid, my mid-tones are set to 42 IR excuse me, 42 IRE, which is what V-Log's uh, mid-tone is designed for. So the camera gives me a readout. On the bottom of the screen, you'll see it. Right now it says plus 2.9 stops. What that's telling me is I am 2.9 stops overexposed for my mid-tones. So I'm, I'm that much brighter right now than, than I really should be. If I'm in the mode of setting the camera up to properly show uh, the, the tone curve that I can get out of this, this image. So a couple things I can do for this. I can bring my ISOs down, uh, which in this case, bringing it to 640 uh, with the lens that I have on here, which is only 2.8, gives me a little bit of a challenge because now I'm underexposed in my uh, um, Midtones, I'm underexposed by about half a stop, which is not good in V-Log. Don't underexpose V-Log. Um, underexposing any log footage is not a good idea. You want to either properly expose it or selectively overexpose it. So in this case, I'm just going to bring this up to 4,000 ISO because I know that that's my next native range. And again, I'm 2.2 2 .2 stops overexposed now. So now I'm going to come in and use my aperture to bring this down. Uh, now... If you don't want to use aperture, if you were trying to set this up so that you were 
uh, shooting as wide open as you possibly can, but you want to still bring your exposure down. This is where you would use ND filters uh, for this particular case, but I don't have any on me right now, so we're just showing you with aperture. So right now, luminance spot meter is telling me that my midtones are properly exposed. That is that skin tone is going to be in the right range. My uh, basic look of the image is going to be, you know, th this is how the image is going to look. If I color grade this, it's the proper look for the way this image should be. But we also know that in some cases, that's not really how we want this to look. So I'm going to turn view assist over HDMI on. Uh, and we're going to turn this on to throw a 709 LUT on it. And you'll see now, some areas are dark. My, you know, that area underneath the S5 Mark II between the, uh, under where the focus box is, is dark. It is in the shadowed region. My highlights on this part of the image, you see that they are, there's a little bit of a blown out section. But, tonally, this is the proper exposure using Luminant Spot Meter to tell me, I want my midtones. That's what I care about most as being, you know, properly exposed. I can shape my light otherwise. I can bring this in to actually boost up those shadows a bit. I can shift this around a bit more because maybe I want, you know, this section to be lit a little bit better. But again, my midtones are properly exposed. I I can also go in here and check and say, hey, okay, if I know that my midtones are about exposed properly, how dark is this down here? Where in the basement of this image is that part? So that's underexposed by 6.3 stops. How bright is my wall up here? That's underexposed by under by 1.4 stops. Uh, but if I go back in again I say I go back onto my gray card my gray card is again telling me I'm proper so if I'm looking at this if I turn uh, exposure off here you'll see that it's it's dull it's you know kind of drab if I turn it back on if I literally just threw a LUT on top of the log footage that's about what you're gonna get which means my skin tones look right there is a th there are a lot of people that will also look and say hey I get that the midtones here are are important. I want my skin tones to be at 42 IRE. But in some cases, maybe I don't want this to be just buried down in the basement of the shadows. Maybe I want to edit so that I can pull in details in those shadows. Well, that is where the idea of overexposing comes in. So that is where if I say jump this up to 2.8, you see we're a bit out of the basement here. Uh, we have this section now at three and a half stops underexposed. Yeah, just about three and a half stops. So I, when I go back over here, you'll see that we're probably going to be up, yeah, about 2.2 stops. The thing you have to remember with this now is that when you bring this into post and you have to bring the, those selectively, those looks back down, you are going to get a cleaner looking shadow by doing this when you stay on the native ISOs at 640 or 4000. However, you are going to be potentially causing some color shifting in what your midtones look like, depending on what your level of capabilities are for grading. When you shoot this way, you can't necessarily just throw a LUT on it and say, hey, this is good to go because you'll see now it, it's, it does not look like that in real person. If I bring this back down and I bring this to about where we were, so it's about a stop, or uh, in this case, it's about half a, half a stop overexposed, you see that this is actually fairly close to what this looks like in person sitting on my desk here. So you've got this tool, Luminance Spot Meter, to be able to go in and say, how do you want your image to be exposed? If I take this light and say I move this light uh, as I'm talking away from the microphone again, if I take this light and I move this all the way up into the top here, say I want to see, well, how overexposed is that part of the image? Now that I've got this light here, see that we're 6.1 stops overexposed in that particular spot. If I come in and I uh, bring my exposure up a little bit, 6.2, 6.3, it stops at 6.3. That means that technically, if I am exposing to protect my highlights, 
at six to six point two, realistically, you want to probably try to stay around six. You can go up to six point three if you want. Um, that highlight is not actually blown out. That highlight is is properly within the range. Um, so I have the ability to look and say, I, I know that I've got this, this highlight protected. If I come back in here and I move this back over to the gray card and I uh, Raven, I'm actually, I'm going to address your question in a, in a, your, your comment in a second. Um, the gray card is saying that like, Hey, I'm, I'm in, I'm at proper exposure. I have enough flexibility in vlog to save this highlight. And I know that through what our vlog curve is designed for, I know that down in this shadow region, um, if I'm not looking to pull all of that shadow out, I know that I've got flexibility for grading and giving a nice uh, contrast curve to have some detail in that shadow and not just have it fall off the bottom of the, the scale there. Uh, now to Raven's point here, uh, using the white balance target, the 42 IRE should be on the black, white, three bars. Yes. So this is the proper one to use. Um, Raven is completely correct. Uh, if I were to take this, move this into the proper setup here. Um, gray card, kind of just a relative explanation here. So if I come in here and I put this on the gray card, um, move this a little bit closer just so it's big enough to actually show you here. If I bring this in here, you see there is a difference there. So now if I bring this up to what that should be one. So that's at zero. Now if I bring my uh, tool over here and we look up at the light, you'll see that the light's going to be well gone from the protected highlights. Uh, and my shadowed region down here, right under 3.7, so it's almost two stop difference there. Uh, if I start to bring this down so that I'm protecting my highlights, which is going to bring me back to that other exposure, uh, y this is where you, you have to kind of pick what it is that you want to shoot with or how you want to actually shoot the image. Um, Vlog is designed that the 42 IRE, so the gray, uh, video gray here, 42 IRE is what your skin tone should be uh, if you use luminance spot meter and set that properly. So as I showed, make sure that this is set properly to be your 42 IRE. That's going to tell you that, look, your skin tones are right. They're in the right range. Now you can come in and light the rest of this image with your, your lighting to either bring your shadows up, to crush your shadows down, or to uh, what kind of uh, uh, diffusion do you need to protect your highlights to bring those in. You will find a point where you just can't get all of it within the range of Vlog and you will have to make a decision. Um, as I said, be careful about overexposing with this. If you overexpose and then you start to play around with it too much, um, I mean, yeah, we've got RAW, you've got those different tools there. You can get some different uh, kind of effects that happen when you do this. Uh, I'm sure if you... Talk to Dennis or some of the others. They've probably can explain better uh, than I can what it is that you want to look out for. But um, this tool should be your best friend if you are looking to create uh, really kind of any massive higher end quality video. Luminance Spot Meter, we're one of the only companies, actually I think we are now the only company that's actually showing you this, giving you these tools, giving you the information that you want to make sure your midtones are here, make sure it's set. Vlog shows you zero zero as your midtones properly exposed, so you can actually shape and create an image that looks the way you want it based on how you shape lights uh, in your particular video. Um, a bunch more questions came in. Um, let me see here. Question: Is it possible to have some to the three two ratio option added in ProRes SSD recording? Uh, it has been brought up. Um, it has been brought up to our engineers. I don't have a response back yet as to whether or not it's possible, whether or not we will do it. Um, but yeah, at this point, I don't have uh, an answer for that yet. Uh, when recording internally, 5.9K, 16x9 plus HDMI, I get a 16x9 in, image on the HDMI. But when I use 6K32 internal, I get a 3.2 on HDMI. Can the HDMI be cropped to 16 by 9 when recording 3.2 internally? No, it cannot. 
Uh, the reason being is that when you are setting the camera up as 6K in open gate, it is sending the 3 by 2 ratio out over HDMI within a 3840 by 2160 container. So that means you're going to get pillar boxes on the side of your frames um, because it has to take that 3.2. That is what you are recording. And then it's sending that out and then putting it in 16 by 9 so that the recorder can see it. Um, at this point, does not have uh, we don't have the, the system set up to be able to uh, have you show that um, or have it m output multiple, like various different multiple ratios. Um, that would mean that the camera would have to be recording in 6K internally and also processing at the same time a 16 by 9 cropped version of that out over HDMI. Um, so at this point, no. Um, but who knows? Uh, it is something that we have asked, the, asked our engineers about. Uh, speaking of waveform, I would like to add my voice to the waveform for Still's future request. Uh, you and me both. I would love to have waveforms for uh, still shooting as well. Thinking of getting a V-mount battery for weddings, GH6 plus a 5-inch monitor. I know it depends on power consumption. Do you think a 99-watt-hour battery would be sufficient? Uh, any experience? 99-watt-hour um, is a lot. I, I guess it would depend on what kind of wedding. Uh, you're photographing if it's a catholic wedding if it's a uh, non-denominational wedding if it's a uh, jewish wedding whatever they all run so vastly different in time depending on what it is that you're doing if it's a justice of the peace that's totally different um 99 watt hour battery is a lot of battery uh the thing that i can tell you is that well well technically we do not um we as a brand do not recommend uh, using third-party external battery couplers, things like that. I know there are a bunch that exist. Um, I know we have shown uh, some of these solutions out at trade shows when working with partners like Condor Blue. Um, so as far as power consumption goes, uh, I can speak of at trade shows where cameras are getting played around with a lot. Uh, the cameras that have been powered on external power solutions like V-mount batteries through DTAP uh, in other companies' booths, they have lasted for quite some time. Um, yeah, they, they've lasted for like an entire day's trade show, and that would be like, I don't know, 8 a.m. till probably 6 p.m. Uh, as a good reference for time. Uh, and those are typically running on... What's the one that we've used? I'm looking off camera at, at my V-mount battery that I've got sitting on my desk. Uh, and that's a 50 watt hour. And we've been able to get through about a trade show's date. So that's about 9 to 5-ish. So hopefully that kind of helps, uh, Zizo. Um, 99 watt hour is a lot. Um, the downside of using those uh, dummy batteries, though, is that you lose redundancy. Um, if you are using powering over USB-C, if you're not recording to SSDs, if you are just recording internally to the SD cards, uh, or the CF Express on like the GH6, um, you could just power it through, um, USB-C. Uh, so that means that you could use something like, um, you could use something like this. This is the FX Lion, uh, Nano 1 battery that I use. This is a V-mount battery. It has DTAP uh, plug-in. It also has USB-C output. Um, it also has a micro as well as an A. Um, and it has an output um, read on it here. So it'll tell me what the voltage is and all that stuff. Um, but this is a nice one um, because I can actually power our cameras over USB-C. This provides 9 volt 3 amp um, and it could work. Um, yeah. Um... Hello, Sean. I am a I am Lumix S5 Mark II X owner and wondering if you can show how to track one person while shooting video in a crowded place, please. Uh, yeah, sure. So, uh, help if I went back to my camera. Um, have to plug my camera back in. Had to move stuff. Sorry, guys. Uh, so yeah, if if you want to use the um, the Lumix system for say. Uh, 
video production and you want to use the focusing uh, in, in larger groups, you've got a couple things that you can do here. Uh, the one area or the full area when you have subject detection turned on, this is going to use the tracking information that the camera is generating to determine the subject that you had in focus, where it should go, where it should stay. Um, and it, it, it can change. It's designed to not change that often, but it can. One of the things that I recommend uh, for a lot of people, if you're going to be um, in a wedding or an event and you want to focus on one person, you know who that person is that you want to focus on, is use either one area plus or one area with the human detection modes turned on. And the reason for this is to think of these particular options here. The um, Think of one area, one area plus, zone, full area as the fail-safe or the fallback uh, options for focusing in situations where maybe you don't have a subject in view. So, if you have this set as one area, or one area plus in this case, what, it, what the camera's going to do is it's going to use the detection algorithms when a subject that matches the detection mode that you're looking at is touching that box. So if I want one person to be focused on, I want this box to be on that that person, but it's going to use the excuse me, the subject detection. The reason I recommend this as well is that if that person moves or gets obscured or say is in a position where subject detection may not be picking them up. Um good example of this is say on like motorcycles. Because I, if you followed along, I love photographing motorcycles. And subject detection for humans is kind of hard to determine when you've got a human that's kind of like hunched over with a full face helmet on. They don't look like people. So the way the camera, the way I have my camera set up is to w the one area or one area plus with human detection turned on so that when it does detect the person and it puts the box around a person, that's what you're focusing on or the face and eyes, that's what it prioritizes. But when it doesn't, it doesn't just go to the full area and then look for the next subject that it maybe thinks that you want to have it focus on. One area, one area plus says, I don't care what, what subject detection, whether you've got it or not, this is the area that you want the system to work with. Um, no camera's focusing system. I don't care who makes it, uh, what reputation they have in the industry. No system's perfect, and I've seen equal examples of cameras that are supposedly the best in the world where I'm doing something as simple as this where I'm on YouTube and I'm talking to camera I've seen them just freak out because if you're not telling the camera what to use when subject detection fails it's going to pick for you and 9 out of 10 times I'm willing to bet it's not going to pick what you want it to do so using our subject uh, our AF modes in this case you think of them as the fail safe. So back to that point, if you want to track one person in a in a crowded place, use one area, one area plus with the subject detection, and that should get you, I'd say, like 99 or 90% of the way to where you want it to go. Uh, Small Brown Fox, uh, mobile power solutions are an issue. I use Hawkwood adapter, but we need an OEM solution for V-mount. I, I would highly doubt that you'll see an OEM solution for V-mount, um, mainly because uh, V-mount is just straight voltage out. Um, yeah, cameras don't run on 14 or 16 volts. Uh, th these kinds of cameras don't. So, Red Frame says, I lost the cable clamp protector that came uh, with my GH6. Where could I get one new from? Uh, that's a good question. I honestly don't know. Um, it's possible that if you just do a part search, uh, or contact our service and support, maybe they'd be able to let you know where you can get one. Um, I don't even know what the part number would be for that, but I can look for you, Red Frame. Uh, missed the beginning of the live stream, but rewound to the beginning. Thanks for answering the 100 to 400. That's reassuring. Okay, cool. Thanks. Thanks for, uh, uh, tuning back in and going back. Um... Okay, I got one more thing that I wanted to talk about as far as the specialty uh, kind of things with our cameras, and that is the real-time LUT functionality. We've talked about it a lot, but I, this is something that I am going to, uh, as often as I can, I am going to drive this home as hard as I possibly can 
because it is possibly one of the coolest things um, that I really, really love uh, is the ability to come in and actually customize my own looks. So like right here, I've got, you know, a, a look that I want to kind of create um, for both photo and video. And it doesn't necessarily, you know, these are starting to get into those ideas to say like, hey, I, you know, I want it to either be, you know, fully color accurate or I want it to be stylistic. I'm a very stylistic person, so I like to, you know, I, I don't care if this is maybe the most technically perfect looking image properly exposed. Does it look the way I want it to look? Cool. There we go. Um, Real-time LUT is a function that we put into these cameras, and there's two aspects of the way this works. There's the real-time LUT actual color profile, which is actually called real-time LUT, which is always going to have a base of V-Log, but allows me to come in and put different uh, looks on that particular image. So if I wanted to have a real-time LUT, I want to have, say, V-Log, but I want to apply a look that's going to, you know, maybe emulate, in this case, Kodachrome, uh, or I wanted to emulate, you know, like 709, whatever. This allows me to utilize the V-Log, but apply the look that I like on this to have it, you know, look the way I want it. And Noah Brutt brings up, actually, probably one of the best use cases for this is if I know that, say, I'm shooting in a mixed camera environment. So I'm I'm on my Lumix camera. Say my friend's got a camera from one of the other camera brands, and they're the primary camera, but I want my footage to mix pretty closely with theirs. So, you know, I want to dumb down the image quality on my camera a little bit. <laughs> that was a joke. Um, I can create a LUT, load it into my camera, and then have my camera basically emulate that particular camera's look. Um, this is something that you can do where if you create a specific look or a transform uh, in something like Resolve, you can have it kick out a LUT of that, load it into the camera, and then now you've got our V-Log being transformed into, that say, that other company's log footage because you want it to kind of match and fit into a workflow. Uh, that's totally one of the things you can do with the real-time LUT function. But the second part of this is actually geared more towards the creative side, where if you're not necessarily using this to, say, match another camera brand or match another camera that you're working with, or even if you're not using it because you want to shoot log, but you don't necessarily want to have to shoot log, you want to, you know, shoot as close to your you know, kind of pre or your post-graded footage, or at least the first pass of your LUT. We also have the ability to apply LUTs that are designed in the sRGB color space over different color profiles. So as a photographer, I, as much as I love shooting raw photography and being able to bring it to my computer, edit, and just have all the flexibility of that image possible, there are a lot of times where I just want to shoot and I really like the way it looks out of the camera, so I'm just going to take the JPEG and I'm good to go. Um, I will still always shoot RAW plus JPEG, but I, like the last couple of weeks while I was on vacation, I shot explicitly with real-time LUT, uh, in this case doing the custom set where I've got, um, I was using these particular color profiles over my standard color base so that when I take them, load them on my, my phone and send photos to my family, stuff like that, they already look the way I want them to look. Um, so this allows me to say, hey, I want to take my standard color profile, the standard uh, color base that's in the camera, and I want to apply a LUT on top of that. So in this case, I chose Kodachrome 1930s. Uh, and again, these are these are uh, based from the Art of Photography's uh, imagery. So if you look, he has the Fujified and the Kodakified uh, look. So definitely go go support um, uh, go support Art of Photography. Um, check out his LUT packs, or not, I don't know if he's got the LUT packs out. Um, go check out his presets uh, and uh, uh, profiles over on his website. They're super cool if you like uh, emulating the old school film days. But 
Uh, I've got LUT versions loaded onto the camera so that I can mimic that in camera and just be able to take the photo, have my JPEG already look like this, not have to bring it into software, and then be able to share those images. And you can do this with any any of the color profiles here. So I can program in up to 10 of them. I have, uh, I believe, seven of them or six of them profiled already. But I also can come in and adjust things like how much contrast do I want to add to this particular look? Uh, what base do I want it to be under? Do I actually want this to be under, say, uh, let's say changes into landscape because maybe I like the way the tones work a little bit better. Now, are these going to be like true... Uh, recreations of those old looks not necessarily they're going to get you within the realm uh, but you have all of that kind of flexibility within the mark ii the mark ii x because we built these right into the camera now um, even jumping around like in some cases you'll notice like you know you want to go to some maybe much more vibrant film stocks or maybe you have a film look that you particularly like um, you have the ability to program them in and just get a look that is pleasing for you or for the project that you're working on, whether it's photography or videography. Uh, the one thing I would just highly recommend here or highly state is that if you are using the LUTs and you want to use them in a stills perspective, but you want to retain the raw file, don't shoot in real time LUT. Have the LUT built based off standard or natural or flat or 709. One of the standard color profiles because of the fact that V-Log is not really designed to be shooting a 14-bit raw still image, um, you the ISOs are different. They function differently than they do in standard uh, color profiles. Just keep those things in, in the back of your mind when you're working with LUTs in the stills perspective uh, with this particular camera. In video, you don't really worry about it because usually you're setting a LUT up over standard. But this can work as well if you're in video making your own look that is maybe the grade that you apply to Cinelike D or Cinelike V. If you prefer those profiles and you already know how when you bring it into Premiere or Resolve, you add this particular look to it, we'll kick that out as a LUT, load it onto the camera in 33 point, and you can, for the most part, skip that step that you were doing when you first ingest that footage into the software. So I did not realize that it's already too, it's already almost 2 30 and um i do actually have to end the stream um i know that i missed a couple of things uh to get to um so i will for the question about the shutter options the shutter speed all that kind of stuff um if you drop that uh if you drop that question in the comment after the video i will text respond to that uh particular one um it's fairly straightforward um, or the shutter uh, question. I can explain it a little bit easier there. Um, but we will be back next Thursday at 2 p.m. Um, I'm still working at all the details. Uh, we are going to actually start bringing in some guests over the next couple of weeks or the next couple of months uh, to come in and join us uh, once a month. So be on the lookout for those. Uh, if you liked uh, what we talked about today, um, give us a like. Um, if you, if you have more comments or questions or you want, ha you mentioned something in the chat that you want our engineers to see, um, leave it as a comment after the video is posted as well. That helps us out tremendously. It also helps the algorithm as we've said before. Um, other than that, thank you everybody so much. I look forward to talking to you again next Thursday at 2 PM. Uh, and I hope you have a great rest of your weekend and get out there and create some cool stuff and. Let us see it out there, whether you're on social or whatever. Um, so yeah, take care. Have an awesome weekend. See you next Thursday, 2 p.m. Later.